So we'll be getting it. Um, okay, uh -oh. turn the camera back on. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's funny. Um, <sighs> We've already proved that this was Hausdorff, right? Because we that we went through those arguments last time, remember? So we have a continuous map from a compact space to a Hausdorff space. And it's uh, it's also a bijection, I think. I'm trying to remember. He says we have a bijective map from a compact space to a Hausdorff space, so J is a homeomorphism. So I mean it's also clear that J is bijective here. That's a little worrisome to me because it's running through something which is you know, not a bijection, right? I mean, this is a surjection, right? So it stands to reason this can hit everything in here. And this is injective, right? This is an inclusion. That's injective. But this is not surjective, because it only hits the upper half sphere. This, well, this is, this is surjective and bijective, right? So why, why is it that this is bijective? Why is J bijective? I mean, I think maybe given in one simple way, we could just check, think about images, right? Like if you have J of um, what? In J of X equal to J of Y, what would that mean? That would mean I of I of psi inverse of x is equal to pi of i of psi inverse of y, right? But that would be pi of psi inverse of x is equal to pi of psi inverse of y, right? Because the inclusion map just keeps it put, right? So, you said pi was surjective but not injective. Yes. So why must it be that x equals to y here? So this is a, you said this is a 2 to 1 map, right? Yeah. What kind of twos? Po uh, antipodal pairs, right? Mm -hmm. You can't have an antipodal pair here, so it has to be that they're equal. You're saying you can't have you can't have negative x or y here in any case because if right. you're you taking the positive yeah, sphere, yeah, we're in the, the upper half sphere. So that if, x, if if those are equal, then it must be that they're equal. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, aha. Uh -huh. So it is not a sphere. It is isomorphic to. I'm sorry, not isomorphic. Listen to me. <laughs> Homeo homeomorphic to projective two space. All right. Um, example five point two one. Trying to make sure we have enough here so we can see the coordinates on a projective manifold later. That's really what I want. Wanting here. It's a little funny. All right, so here it is. Example 5.21. So we, we have um, for in, every index i, i equals to 0, 1, 2, da 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 n, the subset a sub i, what is a sub i defined to be? The equivalence class, right? X not X n. That's an element of P n R such that what such that X i is not equal to zero. He says that this is an open set homeomorphic to Rn. And uh, thus, um, A0, collection A0, A1, 
uh, all the way up to an is an identification cover. Let's see here, he says, if we denote, all right, if we denote pi, the mapping from Rn plus 1 with 0 removed, the origin removed, rather, to um, P and R, the usual um, quotient map, then under that, if we look at the inverse image, right, of AI, what do we get? I'll do the easy part. Um, X naught, X1, Xn in Rn plus 1 with the origin removed. I mean, it's an inverse image. It's got to be up in there somewhere. What's the condition on that uh, the n plus one tuple? What's the condition on these? So we're looking at the inverse image of AI. AI is these equivalence classes, right? X naught through Xn such that what? Xi is not equal to zero. So it's just that. Oh. I was thinking that, but I thought that was too simple to say. Yeah. <laughs> nope. I don't want to say it was stupid. <laughs> nope. It was literally that simple. Now, let me just take a step but before I do any more of his stuff. Um, let's just kind of unravel this a little bit. What is it? What is an equivalence class? So here we're actually taking the view. Let me just take the viewpoint to be concrete. That PN um, PNR is actually. Let me take the viewpoint that PPNR is actually a collection of of sets in Rn plus one. Um, just like complex numbers or anything else, you can formally view them by their pro pro properties, right? So maybe from, from some viewpoint, this isn't entirely necessary. But I think it's helpful to be concrete when we're first learning something like this. So what is, you know, what is actually this set? It's the set lambda times x naught xn such that what? I mean, that's the orbit of a vector by dilations. It's just all possible scalar multiples of the vector. That's just a line through the origin in that direction. That's, that's what it is. But A1 is not just one of those, right? It's the collection of, of all such things, right? It's a collection of all such things, such that, that x sub i is not equal to 0. Let's, let's look at this in two dimensions. It's always helpful to take a step back and look at two dimensions. So like P1. Right. What is what does a one look like there? X y such that what? X 
X, <laughs> right? So I can even draw a picture of it. We're looking at lines through the origin, right? Which what? Which don't have X equal to zero. And they're like, if you look at, so the direction, I mean, think of this as being the direction vector for the line, right? Maybe, I don't know, so x, x cannot be zero. What would x be zero be? It would be What is it? What's the thing that's out? The y-axis. Yeah, y, y vary. I mean, so yeah, the y-axis, that's the thing that's missing. But <clears throat> Every single other projective line all of those are in there. Whereas if you look at A2, right, you know what's going to happen. It's going to be missing the, the x-axis. But then you've got all other projective lines through the origin, right? That's A2. Their union, right, is everything. And why can we say they're an identification cover? What was the technical condition we needed on the things in the cover? so many sections ago. Did we cover this um, when we just started to go over um, quotient topology? Yeah, it's um, it was in part one. It may be in section one here. I think it was like the first thing you mentioned. Example 5.2 Let A be a cover of a space X and consider the dist oh, disjoint union. I saw you guys have discussed the disjoint union. Oh no, don't tell anyone. Um, I should come back to that. Good grief. Um, <coughs> let A be a cover space, <coughs> consider disjoint union, y, disjoint union Y. The natural map Y to X is continuous onto an identification, if and only if A is an identification cover. Okay, where did you find that identification cover? I think it was the first thing in 5 1, wasn't it? A continuous map. Well, there he defines, he defines an identification in definition 5.1. And saturated sets. Um, has he defined identification cover in a previous chapter? Seventy-two, supposedly. Oh, it's in the previous chapter. No wonder I can't find it. That's uh, back on page seventy-two. Um, definition 4.3.2, which we have, of course, talked about, but I forgot, but the A be a cover of X, we say A is an identification cover in the case that U, a subset of X, is open if and only if the intersection of U and A is open for every A in the identification cover. So it's, it's only an identification cover if the intersection um, of the cover, anything in the cover with an open with any open set is again open. So the, the, the open sets in here you can kind of visualize in terms of S1 most easily. So the open sets in S1 are like bent open intervals. So the open sets in here correspond to like fuzzy edges of fa fu fuzzy fans, <laughs> if you will. And if you think about the fuzzy fan, if you take any fuzzy fan and you intersect it with one of these, you got another fuzzy fan, so it's open. So, yeah. Nice mathematical term. Okay. And you see what's going to happen with, with three, right? It's not a line anymore that you miss. It's the YZ plane. 
or the you know x y plane or the z x plane you, you lose planes but because when you look at the equation when you look at this equation x sub i equals to zero right that gives you a, a space of co-dimension one so it's an n minus one dimensional space when you're in rn excuse me it's an n dimensional space right because if we're, we're in rn plus one so this is, a, this is an n-dimensional space. The solution set to this equals zero. All right, so getting back to the point. Let's try to wrap this up here, if I can. Um, any, any questions about what we've done so far? So I hope that gives you a better sense of what on earth this is. It makes sense what it is, right? I mean, you, you kind of see it now? And you agree about this, you agree about that. Um, now, he, now he writes a mapping F from Rn to A0. Okay, I'm going to, I think I'm going to put it away. So, so guys, just a little, you know, I, well, I think I already talked to you, you guys were, in, of course, in advance, so you know already, at least a kind of a fuzzy picture of a manifold. A manifold is what? It's a set which admits. Um, you know, homeomorphisms essentially to, to Rn locally at least. So you have to find a collection of charts, right? Mappings from Rn to, to the abstract space. Um, this projective n space is an n dimensional manifold. This f I'm about to write is in fact a coordinate chart. Well, it's actually a patch, it goes the other way. It goes from Rn to A dot. Check this out. So here we go. F F being a mapping um, from Rn to A0. And what's his definition for that? F of y1, y2, da, 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 yn is equal to what? So wouldn't we bracket zero comma y one y two dot y n? Well, that would be exactly the wrong thing to do. But it's so wrong, it's kind of right. I want to write it because it's like it's just like I said, it's, it's exactly the wrong thing to do, but in such a way that it, it shows us what the right thing to do is. Because we want a sub zero is the things that have everything. The only one there's only one thing which can't be zero. <laughs> First one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, it's a good, it's a good mistake. It's, a, it's, it's legit. I mean, I like that. That's a, that's a proper mistake. So, that, <coughs> of course, you could put a two there, but we put or a one. pi or, or pi or yeah, seven. Irrational. Certain people would put seven there, obviously. Um, <laughs> this would, yeah, this would be fair. <laughs> so, um, he says this is continuous and bijective. I think we can agree with that. Um, co continuity is, well, I guess you could try to, I mean, you, maybe you could sort through the definitions and prove all that, but um, the bijectivity, what would happen if you had two of these were equal? So, uh, well, it would be a scalar well, multiple of those, so then you have to look at the first component. Right? Yeah, that's the, then that automatically. There's, there is something to show there, right? If we have f of y1, you, 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 I think you already see it, Nathan, um, f of z1, what would that tell me? That would tell me 1, y1, yn, right, is equal to 1, z1, zn, which would mean that if these are, if these are, if these are the same equivalence classes under the, the, uh, the, the dilation orbits, that means that <coughs> But of course, when you multiply that in, you get, right? 
So this, so lambda must equal to 1, which implies then that y sub i is equal to z sub i for all i. So it's injective, yeah. I still claim continuity follows because we have a formula. That's not, I'm just being glib. You can study the inverse image of open sets as open. Or perhaps there's some kind of universal principle that could be used here. Who knows? Anyway, I'm going to set that aside and, and continue to think about the formulas, which are pretty awesome. Now, um, as you guys know, the more tired I am, the more beloving I become for formulas. Um, beloving is not really a word. Let's see here. You know, he looks at the inverse of f composed with pi. All right, let's see if we can understand that. Ooh, dizzy. Not cool. Let's see here. So pi, what was pi? Pi was uh, blah, 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 blah. This, this guy, right? Um, which pi? I think you can talk about the... I mean, I think... Uh, well... Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, so pi... Pi inverse composed with f. Of what? Of, I guess, what would you do? Y1, Y2, da, 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 Yn, what would that be equal to? Pi inverse of the 1, Y1, Yn, right? Let's see here, just, let's just write it out. What is that? That is... We're looking for like x, x naught, x one, da, 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 x n, in R n plus one, with the origin removed, such that what? Where does pi of x have to map to? Does that make sense to you guys? No is an acceptable answer. Since I might be wrong. <laughs> I mean, um, that's just the definition of inverse. Hopefully. Image, right? Right, the inverse image of a set, right? And square brackets 1 comma y, 1, one through n is a, is a set, right? So... Wait, so pi maps from rn plus 1 minus the origin to pnr. Right. A naught, of course, is a subset of PNR, right? It's part of an identification cover. So, should PNR. that be equal then, not element, since pi maps from Rn plus 1 minus the origin to PNR, and the elements of PNR are in fact those equivalence classes? Yes. Thank you. I don't really, I, like I told you, I, I really don't trust myself today. Thank you. Snake equals. All right, there we go. <laughs> Taking, giving you guys a lecture into the color dimension. We're using color to find new, newfound space between other things. All right, sorry, I'm being stupid. All right, um, so what is that? What is that? What does it mean for pi of that to be that? And it means that that point in Rn plus 1 minus the origin is part of that line in projective space. 
So in other words, we could just say that this is equal to 1 y1 y2 da 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 yn? Or is that too greedy? Um, hmm. I think so. Uh, <laughs> here's a question. Is what I'm writing even logical to write? Where does F go from? Does that make sense? Uh, See, because he's looking at F inverse composed with pi. <laughs> uh, I don't know why you guys listen to me. Um, uh, it may still make sense. I don't know. Let me think about it for a second. F goes from Rn to A naught, right? No, I think it makes sense. And then A naught is a subset of Pn, so pi inverse. Yeah, I think it does make sense, actually. Yeah. Like, I think you could show what you just did by double entertainment pretty easily. Okay. Let's look at the other one then. F in, I'm supposed to look at F inverse composed of pi, all right? What's that look like? Well, pi, pi what's pi e? Pi e is, so I look at x, x naught, right? Xn. So that would be F inverse of what? F inverse of? X not X one X n right. So you trade the point for the line which contains the point, excluding the origin of course, and then f inverse of that is what. Would it be? Um, so we. I think we should assume. We. I, I think we need to assume that x. I think we need to assume that x not. X n is an element of the inverse image. Of a not in order for this to make sense. Um, See, because F is a mapping mapping from R and to A naught, right? So the inverse mapping of F must go from A naught to M. So I, I really should only look at points which are in fact mapping to to, to A naught. Oh, okay. I mean, I can't ca I can't calculate the inverse image of something that's not in A naught for F, right? I mean, F inverse has to go like this, right? So once you have that, um, though, okay. F inverse would not be. Um, x1 over x0, x2 over x0, da da da, xn over x0? No, why would that be? Um, no. Well, if you apply that to f, you should get the same thing, right? If you think about it, because... So you're saying the formula is what was it? X, x1 over x0? Yeah. x2 over x0, xn over x0, alright. Because, um... X naught, X one, da da, da X n, um, under the equivalence, that's equivalent to one comma, X one over X naught, X n over X naught. Right. So then that clearly is a. That's that's an important point right there. X naught, X one, X n is equivalent under the dilation equivalence to 
1, x1 over x0, x2 over x0, xn over x0. That's a very important point. For x0, of course, not equal to 0, right? Right. And so as I think about this mapping, right, and I think about what's an inverse for that mapping, let me, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to erase some of this. I think we're making, I, I, I don't know, I, I should just, I'm sorry, guys, I should just cancel today. I don't think I, I Look, we're just trying to find the inverse for a function, right? So, um, what should we do? We should try to solve f inverse, right, of f of y1, yn, right, is equal to y1 through yn, right? That's the one thing we should try to do. But then the other thing we should, of course, try to do is that f of f inverse of, and then you got to be careful what's the correct presentation of something in A0. I think the correct presentation of something in A0 is this, 1, right, um, x1, x2, da da da, x, x, xn, right? That's a typical element. This is a typical element in A0, right? By definition, A0 is, Oh, I guess it's not, is it? It's what? It's uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm jumping the gun. It's typical. Yeah, it, it just is not zero. It's just x so not, but here it's not not equal to zero. Right. And we should show whatever the alleged formula is for f inverse. This should give us back x not x one, x n. So then Nathan makes a claim, which is that f inverse of what is it? X not right. Yeah xn should just be equal to x1 over x0, x2 over x0, right? xn over x0. And then we can judge whether or not that's a valid claim. It makes sense, right? Because we're looking at x0 not equal to 0, so that's good. Formula makes sense. Good sign. Then um, if we take f of this, what happens? F What does that give us? It gives us directly, it gives us 1, x1 over x0, x2 over x0, right? xn over x0. Which is equivalent to x0, x1. Exactly. And that is equal to <coughs> x0, x1, xn. Let me erase this confused mumbling down here. I don't think it was wrong, but it might not have been right. Sorry. I've been listening to Trump too much lately. By the way, I think we should change Trump to some sort of expletive. <laughs> like, I was walking to school today, and I got some Trump on my shoes. <laughs> or, oh my I really trumped up this lecture. Or, I mean, there's so many choices. After last night, though, that was just a laughing stock. That was so bad. I've only heard excer I've only heard excerpts on the, uh, you know. Okay, so that means that this is the inverse, right? So, um, let's see here. So here's the way I look at it. Here's Pn, R, right? which is up here somewhere in Rn plus 1, right? This is a very sketchy picture of it, all right? Then, down here, you've got yourself a copy of Rn, right? And then, okay, but not in all of PNR, but actually just in part of it, just in part of it, A0, right? There's, so what does A0 look like? I mean, A0 is something like, everything except for that line, yeah. right? All fuzzy fans except for that line. Well, it's not even fuzzy fans, they're fuzzy... Fuzzy n-dimensional fans. Fuzzy n fans or something, yeah. There, then there's this, there's this uh, f does what? f goes this way, right? 
and then F inverse goes that way, right? And what does the typical point up here look like? If that point is in, um, you know, if that if that point is in the a if if, that, if that's an a zero, you can present the point as what, as uh, like I guess you can look at the point as x naught, right? Or you could look at the point as one. Look at a point in projective space as being one of these guys. It's five o'clock p.m. In particular, any there's always at any any point in projective space, you can always pick one of the coordinates, right? Put that to one and let the others be totally free to do their thing. And then the um, assuming it's non-zero, right? Yeah. Yeah, again, assume, yeah, assuming the point isn't here. Yeah. Right. So, odds are pretty good. But, <clears throat> um, let's see here, I can say this. So, what would, what would coordinates on projective end space look like then? You know? Wouldn't coordinates just be given by an inverse? Since F is a patch, wouldn't F inverse give you your uh, chart? Yeah, I think that's right. F inverse, uh, <coughs> what's, it, what's it take in? Something like this, yeah. right? I mean, I guess there's different ways of presenting it. This is one. And what, what does it spit out? It spits out what? Uh, one. It just it just just spits out those fractions, doesn't it? So you could look at a typical point in projective space like that, assuming of course x naught is not zero, or you could look at it like this, right? Actually, this looks familiar um, from what I've seen when I've looked into uh, projective spaces before. I think they use this exact same uh, coordinate mapping. Right. I, th there's like a term for it. It's like something coordinates. Yes. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. 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 Is he going to tell us? By the way, of course, there's nothing special about a naught, right? We could just as well do this for a one or a j, yeah, and so like obtain, R2. so R2. obtain, you know, continuous bijections from R n to a good bit of n projective space modulo some, you know, some n plane. The rest of the section, he's basically he just says P n c is the quotient of C n plus one by dilations. Now the lambda is complex. It's a non-zero complex. So the it's not well. What does it mean to multiply? What does it mean to multiply like a comp? For example, a C two vector. Take a C two vector, and multiply by a complex number. What does that? What does that do? Or take a C a C one. Take a, just look at complex, right? I guess you can't do that. I mean, what is? <laughs> we don't look at P zero. I mean, what well, you do? But we haven't. I think that's just a point. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's become more visu visually challenging. What does it mean to look at the orbits of you know you take a complex two vector and then you look at all possible complex multiples of that? What does that what does that look like? I think if you sort of truncate your complex visualization and, and just think of complex as real, it still looks like a like a line, but that line is actually a plane. I don't 
know, geometrically it's challenging. But the, the, the math is the same, though. I mean, he says, he says Pn's projective end space over the complexes is Cn plus 1 zero removed mod G, where G is the group of complex homothetes, I think. I'm probably saying that wrong. Homothetes, I don't know. We endow Pn C with a quotient topology, as I mentioned. And I feel obliged to mention again, if you wanted to give it some other topology, I'm sorry, it would be too late to topologize. Let's see here. You can say it again. You already I, feel, I feel better about my day. Now, um, proposition 5.22, projective spaces, both complex and real, are connected, compact, and Hausdorff. And what he does then is he just looks at the, um, the projections that bring the end spheres into projective end space, or the projective odd, like two, you can take two S2n plus one, and you can, you can, you can project those into complex end space, like, for example, S, let's see, take n equals to one, is what? S3 projects into P, what was it, P1, P1C, I think. That more or less makes sense because this is something that's basically like you could view this as, I mean, this is in some sense, well, it's not in some sense, it's a subset, right? Of, um, of what? Well, it's a collection C of, I'm sorry, it's technically it's a square. collection of, it's a collection of subsets. So I really should say it's a subset of the power set of <laughs> a C2 with zero removed. Oh, I'm writing it. It's awful, but I'm writing it. Okay. Because this is subsets of this space, right? Complex lines through the or with the origin removed. But this this is. Um, Remember, pairs of complex numbers allow for quaternions. Hmm. It's four-dimensional, and S3 yeah. lives in there. So there's the you can you can project this into there in a natural way. And does he have the formula for that? No, he just claims it. Well, he just says it's S two n plus one is just. I mean, here's his definition. You write it down. S two n plus one, he says, is just equal to z and c n plus one, such that what modulus of z, well, the length of z rather, the two the complex n plus one vector is equal to one. That makes sense. Yeah, I suppose that does make sense. That this would naturally. Um, you could naturally fit this into, um, you know, P N C, right? This is something like C N plus one, the origin removed lines through that. If you think about this, that's that's one real equation, right? So, well, well you're starting with like um, C N plus one, you have. I think a one dimensionalist? No. The dimensionality here, I have to think about some more of it. Anyway. Yeah, the, these, you're right though, they do have names. I, I forget the names of these coordinates. Um, and I want to work all the, uh, all the exercises in this section. I think they're interesting. There's formulas here, right? Maybe skip one, 17. But I tell you one thing that I would like to work out, and it's been something I've been meaning to work out for years and years, is the details of 5.22 instead of Grassmannians. Instead of looking at um, just dilations, you have like, they're not lines, they're actually like subspaces. It's a set of subspaces, hmm. the Grassmannians, that's sometimes called the. It's, it's, as you can see, it has a foreboding T symbol on that, but that would definitely be something that would be worth a lot of points if you worked it out carefully. Anyway, so that's pretty much it I have for today. Now the rest of the section, the rest of the chapter, we got like locally compact spaces and then fundamental theorem of algebra. If you look at the details of that, it's pretty much the same as complex. 
Hmm. It always comes back to like the the um, the uh, extreme value theorem with some fine print, but between the first proof we did. Yeah, so I'm gonna let you guys read <coughs> the rest of chapter five. I'm not sure if I should talk about locally compact spaces or not. Maybe I should. I probably should talk about that. That's kind of a an important idea. I'll probably skip the fundamental theorem of algebra and go straight to sequences after that. So next time, hopefully we'll be on sequences. Yeah, what are those called? They're... It should be in Rentland, right? It's his... He has this example. Is it? Yeah. Let's see who finds it first. <laughs> You want your thing though? No, that's no, okay. We'll do that for a second. I'll run out of space soon enough anyway. You said, I thought you said the battery was dying. <laughs> oh, maybe just that. <laughs> it's, the projector space is a nice example of something that's really kind of abstract. It really forces you to face some details in terms of how you're handling coordinate maps that you don't run into if you deal with more concrete examples. So it's, it's a good thing to try to like face and understand, which is why I was trying to talk about it today a little bit. Where's that thing? You're probably cheating and using the index, aren't you? Me? Yeah, I'm no, talking I'm to Nathan's probably trying no. to use the index. That would be, that'd be cheating. I'm just leafing through here. I was looking at the I need no index. Topology like you need those thinking index. 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 I am definitely sick. Ah, uh, homogeneous coordinates. Oh, of course. Mm. Very good. I will have a good weekend, guys. Hopefully I will be able to talk next week. We shall see.